Great stuff. Off you go, Paul. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much. Hi. Uh, my name is Paul. Um, I work with uh, Rob at Black Nailing, and I'm going to talk about how to build shiny apps for economic models. So I suppose uh, I'm going. My talk is, will be a bit different. I don't think there will be any code in it. Um, so let's see how that goes. I, I probably run over then. Just stop. <laughs> Uh, right, so I don't need to convince uh, you that there are tremendous advantages building your models in R compared to Excel, but we are all aware that there is a, a bit of a barrier because not everyone can access these models if, one, if they're not familiar with R, if they can't uh, a program, then of course uh, certain stakeholders just can't interact with the model directly. And so this is why we are sometimes using Shiny. Uh, we should all be familiar wa now with that. Um, so it's a package that allows us to wrap the entire Haldegimic model in a uh, interactive user interface and deploy it online so other stakeholders can just directly engage with the model and they can play around with the slider and, and run different scenarios and see what the outcomes are. Um, now I'm not going to talk about how to actually do that. Uh, that was covered in the previous talk in r j and Rob and I, we have published a paper uh, where we can kind of get the tutorial on the different steps on how to take your model code and deploy a Shiny app uh, with it. Um, what I want to talk about is uh, how to actually design the user interface. Um, so Shiny comes with many very useful templates, and they go like you can do many different things with it. Uh, but sometimes you may want to go beyond that and deploy something a bit more custom, a bit more fancy. Uh, and I first started working with this when I tried to build a survey platform using Shiny, and Shiny is, uh, like the templates are obviously not built for that, and so I had to kind of dig into how to actually like make this happen. Um, and I learned two things. Uh, so the first thing I had to learn was CSS. So CSS is kind of the code, the, the uh, style code that your browser needs to know what the different elements look like, right? So what color a button has, the width, the height, where on the page it should be displayed. Uh, margins and so on. And in the beginning that can be a bit of a daunting <coughs> task because it looks a bit weird, uh, but it's actually not that complicated. So there are maybe uh, 15 or 20 different properties that once you've mastered them, you can deploy most of the, you can do most of the things you, you want to do uh, in terms of the design. And then you just like create a new CSS file in your project folder in your Shiny app, uh, and then you can implement the design. But then there's a actually a much more complicated aspect, and that is uh, the question on how, <laughs> like what, what the design should be, like how do you how to design an interface that find people find uh, easy to use, and I've learned that it's much more complicated than I thought. Um, but maybe, uh, maybe one note on why should we actually care about good UI and good user experience, so UI user interface and UX uh, user experience. Um, one very uh, famous example, on the impact that the user interface, the, the design can have, is from the Obama campaign from 2008, where the marketing team came up with, like a, that was the, the website, to raise uh, f funds. And so they asked people to do, put in their email address. And so the picture on the left is kind of the reference case that they thought this is the best way to, to do the marketing. And, but then they iterated, and they tried many different versions of the button. So instead of signing up, uh, you can say all sorts of different things. They run kind of A-B tests. And eventually they found that a different picture, and instead of sign up, saying learn more, uh, led to a 41% higher conversion rate, which ultimately uh, led to $60 million more in donations. So huge impact. And also, if you uh, use the checkout form on Amazon, you can be sure that every tiny detail of this form is highly optimized. So probably like millions of dollars has been spent on R&D to make every tiny aspect like uh, work perfectly. And uh, yes. <coughs> now in health economics, I, I don't think we need to be <laughs> we don't need to be that ambitious. Uh, but we spend obviously a lot of time on, on making sure the models are validated and they they work properly and they're super fast. And then sometimes the the way we present the model to a wider audience is kind of an afterthought. And I think it could receive a bit more care and attention. Um, to give you just a quick example of what you can do with a bit more thoughtful design. So this is uh, some sort of dashboard. It's about sales, uh, where you can 
look at different sales items and you can buy and sell things. Um, and so this is just a lot of numbers and it looks a bit chaotic. It's not entirely clear what the focus of the page is. And the only thing that stands out is maybe the buy and sell buttons. Now with a few minor tweaks, it can not work anymore. Well, um, <laughs> hmm. can I do something to? I can stop the parent. How do I? Stop. I can't even. Uh, nothing is happening. Let's try stop sharing. Go back. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Sorry, I've ruined your surprise. <laughs> 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 uh, okay, share. Screen. Cool. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, now the big reveal. <laughs> yes, so with a few minor tweaks, you can do this, and this looks much cleaner, and it's a clear focus, um, and it's uh, for, for the user much easier to scan what's on the page, and, and it gives a much better idea on well, what am I supposed to do? What information is important to me? And it actually takes a few kind of design tweaks. It's very easy to implement and um, I think has a huge uh, benefit to the, uh, to the user experience. Now, how do we do that? Uh, obviously, I haven't invented these methods. Uh, web designer use them all the time and I'm definitely not an expert in any of those. But I thought I'd give you a brief overview of what kind of methods you may want to consider using to make your UI better. Broadly speaking, there are five steps. Conceptualization, creating a wireframe, creating a mockup, uh, feedback and testing, and then deploying the prototype. Now, in the conceptualization phase, um, you ideally start with thinking of your target audience. Um, so who is supposed to use the app? Uh, web designers uh, sometimes recommend being very particular and creating actual personas. So you say, uh, you create a person that is called Alice, she works at NICE, she's 30 years old, uh, she plays tennis and listens to classical music to then <laughs> be able to um, make... So ideally this helps you to make much uh, uh, decisions much e easier what kind of features are and aren't useful for Alice. If you think about in a specific person instead of like a vague uh, abstract group. And then you should uh, potentially uh, think about all the different things that Alice wants to achieve on the website. So what are the goals that Alice has? What are the tasks that she needs to complete on your application to achieve her goal? And then kind of map all the different steps that Alice takes through your application. Now, once you have a good understanding, initial understanding of what Alice wants to do, uh, you can start creating a low fidelity wireframe. So that is kind of a rough sketch. What should the app look like? What are the different elements that you want to display? How could you present them? You can use a whiteboard or paper for that, uh, you can create kind of a sketch in, in PowerPoint. And uh, what's very popular among web designers is Figma. It's an online tool um, where you can create kind of these concept wireframes and try to arrange different formation and just try to see, explore different var variations, uh, how to kind of establish a good information hierarchy. Now, once you have uh, an idea of what could potentially work, you can uh, create a more high fidelity mockup. So that is um, kind of making the elements look as they would appear in the actual application. So here, for example, you can explore different styles, like should the buttons be round? Should they have sharp edges? What colors should they be? Um, you can put together an entire page to see what will the page look like? Does it work? Does it make sense to users? Uh, and you can also just create the entire storyline. So create a mock-up of all the different pages that your application should show, all the different states, to then get feedback from users if they understand what's going on um, and potentially save time. However, what we found is that if you just show pictures to people, they sometimes find it difficult to really engage with the problem and really understand like, what they're supposed to do. And if you give them kind of a prototype where they can move things around and something's happening, then this often elicits much better feedback. Yes, and then there are potentially many cycles of feedback and uh, user testing. Um, although I should say 
Receiving feedback on a user interface is <laughs> always a bit of a challenge because what tends to happen, so people are very good at spotting issues. If something is missing, if something is confusing, they're very good at identifying the issue, but then they always have suggestions ad hoc, and those rarely improve the overall UI in the in long run. Um, yes, and so one quick example from an actual project that we had. So this was, this was supposed to be one input in a budget impact model. Um, and we wanted to model the years until the peak market share of a new uh, drug, and then we wanted to model kind of the, the, the market share over time. And underlying this curve, there are all sorts of assumptions, but we thought, well, the user, we only want to give them the key assumption, that is, how many years until pe peak market share. But then, over multiple cycles of feedback, uh, stakeholders always suggested, well, but maybe we want to tweak this aspect of the underlying assumptions, or this one, and this one, and this one. And in the end, we ended up with this component, which well, is very hard to use and very confusing. And at this point, you should probably just throw it away and start from scratch on what should the component look like and what is a, a, a good interaction. <coughs> right, and then you deploy your shiny application. Um, it's always uh, useful to keep in mind that even if you think it's a final, final version, there will always be some bugs that are only found afterwards. And there will always be some adjustments needed to be made to the UI, and so it's good good practice to document properly uh, to be able to maintain it. Right. If I have a bit more time, yeah. yes. Uh, five quick practical tips on how to improve your UI. Something that I found some shiny apps could do to uh, make it uh, uh, look better very quickly. First one: make text easy to read. So um, no one on the internet wants to read like large blocks of text. And so what you can do if there's a lot of text, you can, uh, first of all, uh, just make the line width smaller. So people prefer to read like more narrow uh, paragraphs and just create much more space. If you read online newspapers, you will see that there's a lot of space. Often every <coughs> sentence is its own paragraph. And that's just, uh, it makes it easier to, to scan the entire text. But if you can, just keep it short because long texts are probably not read anyway. Don't overuse colors. Um, so I guess the, the general recommendation is to just use one or two different colors in your Shiny application or in an interface. If you need more colors, you can create different shades of one color. So at the bottom, you have a, a kind of a darker and a lighter version of the blue. That makes the interface just much cleaner and uh, uh, easier to use. A tool that is very useful for that is from Adobe. Uh, there's a color wheel where you can create your own color palette and, and, and try different um, colors. Use loading indicators. So whenever your model does not put out an output instantaneously, you should show your users that something is happening. Otherwise, they click the button, they think, oh, it's not working, and they click the button again, and that just like makes the user experience uh, worse. And so always show some something that, that indicates progress. Um, <laughs> if it takes longer than five seconds, I recommend you show some progress. Because if people see like a spinning indicator for five or ten seconds, they will still assume it's broken. Um, and if you give them some feedback on how long they have to wait, they can be useful. Try different screens. Uh, so this is a shiny app that I built on my laptop. This is how it looks on my laptop. If you have a smaller screen and a low resolution, it looks like this. Yeah. And, so <laughs> and if you try to use it on a mobile phone, it's completely unusable. And to make this actually work on all different <laughs> sorts of screens <laughs> takes a lot of work and it's not always feasible. But I guess it's um, you can try to just like move the width of the browser just to see if there's something quick and easy you can do to, to improve the, the overall aesthetics. And final tip. Do one thing well, not 10 things poorly. So there's a temptation uh, just to take all the inputs that your model has and all the outputs and map them onto Shiny app, uh, Shiny application. And that is really a good idea. And so it's really useful to focus and prioritize where you think uh, what, what you think is much uh, most important, and that makes uh, your eye better. I think that's it. Thank you. So thank you, Paul. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> On the uh, one thing I tried to do before is the uh, animated rendering of the plots. Uh, the spinners to try and get them to work properly. 
Are there many good examples of that out there? I've got really struggle <laughs> to, to get the spinners working. And the, and the graphs that kind of animate when they render instead of just going <laughs> So I think the animated graphs is just a different package. Mm. I think high charter is, is that particular one. And oh, it's the type of chart, I see. Yeah, it's a type of chart. Yeah. Not just a GG plot. Yeah, I know. Right. So there's a question for us. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Jack. Uh, when you're going to build a Sony app, do you have your model built and then go, okay, now how do I build a user interface around it? Or do you think, yeah, what comes first, the model or the user interface? So for us, it really depends. Sometimes people come to us and they have a model and they just, just want the UI. And then we uh, try to build the UI around the model. Sometimes people want to build a model with the user interface in mind. So they want something like a, a communication tool. Um, and then, of course, you can build the model in a way that is much easier to integrate with the, u with the user interface and make them both match. Yeah, so it really depends. Yes. <coughs> practical questions. <laughs> How long does it take? So say you've got a cost per SMS model that you want to put a UI on. How long would you be budgeting for that UI? How many rounds of interaction would you be thinking about? Well, it, it also just depends. You can spend yeah. a lot of time on building an amazing user interface, um, or you can just accelerate the process. If you just have a few days, then well, you can still, I think, improve the UI tremendously if you think about, like, go through the steps and try to think about these uh, issues. Um, but yeah. There's been times where we spent a lot longer on the app than we spent on the model. Put it that way. Yes. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I, I guess you see the range. <laughs> it also really depends on how well we manage the people we work with, because the feedback <coughs> we receive is often of the style an ad hoc change, and then you have like many ad hoc changes to many elements, and then the UI just deteriorates, and then you have to revise everything. So, yeah. That's a question for. <coughs> I think you were hinting at the challenge between. Well, not hinting, but st stating it directly between allowing the user of the app to have a lot of discretion over what they modify and then making it unusable. So what, what are the principles? Because a, a client could potentially get or draw misleading conclusions because they're changing one input, whereas really it's dependent on a lot of other things changing. So what kind of principles guide how you adjudicate that trade-off? I'm not sure if I have any good like golden rule. So what sometimes what what we sometimes do is if we think it's important to give users all the flexibility to change everything, we sometimes just focus the main UI on just the key inputs, maybe four or five, but then have like a, a bit of an expert, like an advanced tab where you can access all the different inputs, but just a bit more hidden away. So if you actually want to use it, you can, but otherwise you're not distracted. Yeah. I'm not sure. So what I can say, there are actually CSS frameworks, so packages that package your CSS code um, in different classes that you can reuse in your Shiny app. So one is Bootstrap that is quite popular, uh, the other one is Tailwind, and there, there are others that kind of help you to define responsive classes. So they have built-in components where you can specify on the element directly. If your, small, if your screen is small, then display it in this way. If your screen is big, display it in a different way. And that makes it much quicker to <coughs> implement the responsibility. Thank you. So time for one super quick question. Just a quick suggestion. When you're developing for multiple uh, sizes, I would probably start always for the most restrictive one. Always start programming with the restrictive uh, mindset. And uh, in that way, whenever you expand the screen, at least it will show something that kind of makes sense. It might not be the prettiest, but at least it will show something. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Paul.